Hello and good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutun. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider what you know of the news of the day. Today we mark World Press Freedom Day, a day of particular importance to working journalists like Sharad and I, but also to the wider public, especially those who see a connection between a free press and good governance. So over the next 30 minutes, we're going to be taking stock of how the media has fared over the last year and where it might be headed in the near future. Let's begin with Jahaba Sadiq, the CEO and editor of the Malaysian Insight. Jahaba, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. Now, this past year, I mean, uh, it's seen not just a global pandemic, but also the suspension of parliament for us. Now, how much has that affected um, the media's ability to act as a, a check and balance to power? And do you think that the media has been able to perform in its role as the fourth estate? Well, I think uh, the main thing is the pandemic has cut us off from uh, the powers uh, that be in the country uh, because everything is through Zoom or very remote uh, ways of reporting. Uh, also, the fact that the government of the day uh, prefers to use official media like Bernama to issue um, their statements, um, you know, uh, and also uh, send a statements without any question and answer. I think the Prime Minister attempted one live telecast of a press conference, which seems so choreographed that, uh, you know, it was worthy of a, of a drama mingo ini and RTM. So, you know, that's how, that's what uh, the limits of media is, because you have no access to people in power. The fact that Parliament has been, uh, what is it, suspended? Uh, because the emergency also means that uh, we have no access to MPs to ask questions in Parliament in an open forum. So we're just dependent on uh, whatever tweet or video or Facebook uh, or live or whatever statement that, that the ministers make. And, and that's all. I mean, as you can see, that, that doesn't give us much to, to go about trying to figure out what's going on with the government of the day, um, and also it, it just diminishes the uh, reporter's ability to go and ferret out information in a, in a you know, very personal question and answer session, uh, mm -hmm. or to meet their sources to get more of what's going on in Malaysia. Yeah, Jabba, it seems that uh, there's been quite a bit of, uh, you know, a, re a reflection of sort of divisions and uh, opposing opinions that we see in the media, especially alternative media, uh, that your organization or a Malaysia Kini or a Code Blue have been able to kind of surface. So there seems to be a, a, a strange kind of paradox. Despite the kind of official shutdown on open communications, the, the media seems to thrive nevertheless. Well, I wouldn't say thrive. Uh... I, I mean, I think the reality is that uh, people are trying to fill up voids uh, in, in stuff uh, that's going on. Uh, a lot of things are actually uh, open to speculation. Um, you know, I, I, I got to say that I think we are back uh, at a time when uh, we didn't celebrate May 3rd so openly. Uh, I think we are back in the 80s, 90s in, in many sense, uh, if you look at it. We are a lot more educated, we are a lot more open, we are a lot more media, but uh, it's a paucity of information out there and, and facts, uh, as it was. You know, I mean, that's why we have anti vaxxers uh, lauding all people through WhatsApp, right? All right. Jabba, I want to come back to something you said about um, not having access to people in power, being dependent on tweets and, and statements, I issuing statements without Q&As. I wanted to ask you, how much of that has to do with the circumstances we find ourselves in. As you, you mentioned, the parliament, uh, you know, we don't have parliament open and um, the pe global pandemic. But how much of that is due to a lack of accountability in the political culture of Malaysia, that elected representatives, you know, politicians, policymakers, they seem to think that they do not have, they don't, don't need to address or engage the media and are able to stonewall certain media. Well, yeah, I, I guess, you know, that's that's the majority point of view and the reality because, as you know, um, the government of the day uh, did not have the people's mandate. Uh, 
they're not answerable to the people via parliament. So, so, you know, as long as there's an emergency, state of emergency in Malaysia, they can carry on doing what they do because, um, you know, who are they accountable to? They're only accountable to themselves, to the Prime Minister of the day. And, and the Prime Minister of the day is keeping this government, you know, barely keeping this government with, with whatever majority that we don't know because there is no parliament to test it. Um, and I think a majority of Malaysians, if you follow the surveys and polls being done, seem to have resigned themselves to the fact that this is the, this government is, is doing what it can do because it is the government of the day. Uh, and as long as the civil service functions, as long as the police force functions at its most uh, basic level, then uh, there are no chaos, there's no riots, and then we are fine. We are better than uh, countries like India or, or anywhere else uh, facing uh, bigger waves of, of uh, the pandemic. Uh, well, but, but yeah, we, we need yeah. to be better than this. We are in the 21st century. We need to be a lot better than this. We can't oh, but Jabba, because yeah, the so powers that be are keeping us here. Uh, Jabba, you know, to the extent that there isn't much resistance, uh, things seem calm. But if people get increasingly frustrated by these so-called dua darja, uh, you know, practices, this, uh, you know, selective application of laws, and, and the police increasingly become intolerant of dissenting voices, as you heard over the last couple of weeks, uh, do you think that we are in for more repressive measures? Uh, I, I, of course, I think people are frustrated, uh, and there's huge dissent that, that you know, uh, I think one poster dismissed uh, social media dissent as, as being a, a drop in the ocean of what of how they do polls. Um, will there will there be more repression? Um, you know, I mean, anyone who's been a journalist for the last, what, 15, 20, 30, 40 years will say, uh, this is par for the course, right? We've, we've been faced, we, have, we are the frogs in, in slowly boiling water for the last three, four decades. So, yeah, I think there'll be a bit more repression going on. Uh, and more so, I think, for the uh, vernacular press, especially the Malay press, because that's the electorate that keeps uh, governments in power. Um, but, and, and I think what will happen is we'll reach a breaking point, but only at the ballot box. You know, I, I think if you recall the last general elections, um, the governor day was uh, slated to win because they had elections on a Wednesday and they had dominance of media and all that. So I think we're coming to that point again. The, the people are always ready for change. They always want something better. But our politicians haven't changed, not in the last 30, 40 years. Um, they are the only pol political dinosaurs that uh, can't seem to be wiped out on from the face of the earth, right? So <laughs> I think we'll just continue Java. with the tango for a long time more to come. Java, thank you for speaking thank with us so tonight. Much. Appreciate yeah. your time. Uh, let's yeah, turn okay. our attention now to uh, independent broadcast journalist and gender activist Tamina Kaosji. She joins us on the line. Tamina, good evening. Thank you for spending time with us tonight. Now, um, much has been said about Malaysia's drastic drop in press freedom indices, but I, I'm just wondering what the reality has been for you uh, on the ground. I mean, how much has the situation changed for working journalists like yourself? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Sherrod, for having me on the show. But, you know, definitely the, the tumble down in press freedom in this is was to be expected. But I think when it comes to working journalists, especially um, the press photographers, the reporters who are going down to the grassroots day in, day out, covering the news of the day, um, they have not been prioritized for the vaccine rollout. I mean, come on, Indonesia, uh, most immediate neighbor, they actually had 5,500 of their journalists vaccinated back in February. Right. So first and foremost, that is one of the things to consider. Um, also, we've had about, according to NUJ, the National Union of Journalists, about 400 journalists have lost their jobs um, in the past year. Their membership has dropped from 1,000 to about 500 as of last month. So plenty of job losses going around. Um, the COVID-19 stimulus and recovery packages also don't adequately, concretely address any of the impact faced by media workers. And I think additionally, of course, when it comes to media's role as the fourth estate, um, just like Jabba mentioned, just that you all have been speaking, that's been critically affected by the fact that uh, press conferences are still restricted to only state broadcasters. So if you can't actually go out there to get the news and the views that you need to report on without fear or favor, that definitely leaves us in a tricky situation, not even to speak about you know, the financial or the economic sustainability on a personal side of things. Yeah. T Tamina, do you think there's a mm -hmm. gender dimension to this? I mean, are women in the profession disproportionately affected by what's happening? Mm -hmm. 
Um, absolutely, yes. Um, I will begin with the actual gendered impact of COVID itself. So um, the gendered cost of reporting while mothering or caregiving during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So I was actually collating material, Sharad, for IFJ, the International Federation of Journalists, um, gender and diversity part of the Malaysia Country Report. And every single journalist who's also a mother pointed out, number one, the lack of childcare support structures. So you combine that with the gendered nature of housework, elderly or convalescent care. So the impacts of the pandemic, working from home, it just means that women journalists, for them, a lot of us, it's actually resulted in stalling career progression, um, reduced work scope, precariousness of work, basically having to lose full-time employment in exchange for freelancing. So that's just the pandemic itself, right? Um, I'd also like to highlight, of course, um, the impact of online gender-based violence and hate speech when it comes to being a woman journalist or a woman media worker. Um, we've we have yet to table even Malaysia's sexual harassment bill, right? So what protections are there for female journalists, particularly those whose DMs are filled with hate speech, with uh, even rape threats, death threats, all sorts of uh, intense, uh, you know, um, violence, the mental impacts, the emotional impacts. Then, of course, there's also blatant workplace sexism and gender discrimination practiced by both state broadcasters, non-state broadcasters. It sees a lot of, you know, Plum, uh, particularly political and economic um, interviews, being by default actually pushed over to male broadcasters or journalists. Just a couple of things happening in this scenario. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all, all valid points and some that resonate with me particularly as well, Tamina. Thank you for bringing them up. Can I ask you, Absolutely. I mean, you know, we're, we're taking advantage of World Press Freedom Day today to kind of raise certain mm -hmm. issues. But what would you like to see, Tamina, in terms of reforms, particularly within mm. the news media industry and within, you know, uh, press freedom? What would you like to see? Um, I think if I could really, uh, you know, Break, boil it down to just one thing, Melissa, what I would really like to see is that all the reforms and institutional changes necessary to actually culminate in an independent, credible media council that's able to arbitrate media standards, um, adjudicate public complaints about materials and, you know, newspapers, magazine, online news sites, all of this. Um, we need our code of ethics, our reporting guidelines, you know, no more daily, weekly um, snafus in how we in the media, first and foremost, cover you know, male violence against women, mental health, suicide, privacy issue, minors, etc. So, you know, I, I actually feel that this the pandemic, the accompanying political instability in Malaysia has actually presented a really golden opportunity for re-evaluating the raison d'etre of media, which is quite simply um, upholding democracy, uh, promoting accountability, and actually supporting Malaysia and her people's aspirations. But um, all this is not going to happen in a vacuum. Um, but at the same time, countries with the strongest media institutions and least legislations are the ones who've seen not only better pandemic control, but also better economic recovery. So this is no coincidence. Their systems are functional by designs. Meanwhile, we have our, you know, 34 odd laws and sub laws, impeding press freedom, freedom of expression. So all of that has to be a continuing, you know, um, work in progress. But I think there's been nothing more positive than the fact that the public has also sort of thrown their weight behind the media. I mean, it was so heartening to see what happened with uh, Malaysia Guineas, almost half a million ringgit being raised in what, less than three, four hours. If people put that same sort of spirit into a publicly funded, transparent, accountable uh, Malaysian Media Council, which honestly would actually cost a lot more than that annually, um, I think we really could be on our way, you know, not just uh, yeah. Mina, looking at the glass yeah, half, the... half and yeah, yeah. Okay, very quickly, Tamina. What can sure. people do, readers, mm -hmm. uh, viewers, what can they do for the media? What they can do for the media, in a word, Sharat, um, paid subscriptions. Get used to that. Be, uh, get used to supporting the media so that we're able to keep our views not only independent, but accountable to you and only you, the public, the right, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank Tamina, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. We're going to take a quick break here on Consider This but More on this topic in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Dan maju. Indo ini adalah Melayu Paling kepada sebuah 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 Kalau itu yang dikehendaki, fine. Mungkin kita berbeza pandangan.
tapi kita mempunyai kuasa yang boleh menentukan budaya di masa hadapan. Polisi yang mesra wanita, sudah tentu dia akan datang daripada pemimpin wanita. Perang COVID-19 masih belum berakhir. Dalam kita berusaha memutuskan rantaian wabak ini, kita jangan terpedaya dengan virus maklumat palsu. Simak fakta melalui www.astroawani.com atau aplikasi Astro Awani. Teruskan berdisiplin, ratakan lengkungan pandemik ini. The third wave of COVID-19 has taken us by storm. There's no room to take anything lightly. Everyone must follow all the steps to stop. Hi, thanks so much for staying with Shrad and I on Consider This. Today is World Press Freedom Day and we've been discussing the nexus between free press and good governance. One area that needs more oversight for a truly sustainable uh, uh, free press is um, the issue of media ownership and control. We're going to be speaking to Norman Goh, who's an independent journalist, uh, in just a couple of minutes. But Sharad, I mean, uh, I love the last question you asked Tamina just now about what the public can do. And uh, again, you know, sometimes we get so used to the fact that some content is free that we don't think about having to pay for news and what that means to newsroom. Yeah, indeed, Melissa. You know, th there is a responsibility on the behalf uh, I mean, for the state, and we're looking at state institutions to step up, but we also need to step up as citizens and consumers. Very important right. uh, a dimension okay. of the problem. Yeah. So Norman Go, independent journalist, is joining us on the line now, and we want to ask him, Norman, uh, we know, we understand that you've been tracking media ownership in Malaysia. Can you uh, walk us through some of the trends that you've been observing amongst uh, Malaysian news organizations? Is there anything uh, that you've been watching that's raised red flags for you? I mean, recently, I mean, first of all, thanks for having me on Consider This. I've been waiting uh, for the show and happy World Press Freedom Day to everyone. Uh, we're looking at one okay. look, uh, the, the, the problems with uh, some of the new ownership uh, right now where we are looking at is media convergence, where the industry itself is really shrinking. And some of them, I mean, recent one we've seen, the Oriental Daily had to shut down their print on April 16. And I've been tracking this, uh, some of the new media ownership. Uh, first of all, coming from uh, the first one, the one we're looking at is uh, particularly coming from uh, Media Prima, where we've seen uh, ownership coming from uh, former finance minister, the second finance minister, Datuk Sri uh, Jawari Abdigani, who owns 15.15 uh, uh, true JAG Capital Holdings in Rimbahad and 4.93% direct ownership of Media Prima. And then there's also emergence of a lot more new uh, media, new new websites, uh, you know, towards the end of last year, um, we have seen new websites coming up. And then this year as well, we have also seen some no new media online portal popping up. Uh, and then it's really hard to actually track one by one because it's just too many of them. And also somehow for me, it really signifies that uh, the election is near. So there's a lot of money going around. And uh, of course, uh, to track these uh, new media companies, first of all, it's quite uh, this data is actually available uh, openly, so we can actually track uh, if usually new some of the media they don't usually publish the name of the company, so it's actually take quite some time for me to track down, uh, for example, the name of the company, the identifiers. Then I was able to actually link together who owns the media, and and this is actually not really a good sign where. Uh, a lot of news consumers are unable to tell uh, who actually controls the media, who owns the media, and whether this new new ownership, uh, what I would say, maybe tycoons, uh, are, do they have say or any influence in the newsroom? Uh, who actually runs the newsroom, whether they influence or dictate uh, the headlines that we are reading every day? Okay. Uh, no, but I want to ask you, you, know, you, you cited that there are a lot of new news media websites coming online. I mean, we've seen the emergence of multiple players within this space, Malaysian Gazette, Malaysia Now, The Vibes, Malaysia Dateline, I could go on. And you seem to think that that's an indication that elections are near. I had read that as the media is thriving, the space, there's, there's, there's more um, 
there are gaps to be filled. How do we think about this? Is the online space saturated? Why do new you know, online players keep popping up? How sustainable is that business? I don't think there's new players are actually sustainable because one thing for sure is actually to run a digital news uh, platform. If you have about uh, 30, say about 30 uh, editors and journalists, you need about half a million ringgit to run on the monthly basis. And some of the new media companies, uh, they do actually pay uh, at a higher uh, market price. Uh, I mean, salaries for, for journalists. But question is, is this sustainable? Because to be honest, a uh, news industry, if you're running a news, news media company, it is not easy to actually raise sufficient uh, uh, revenues to actually cover the operational costs, uh, let alone with so many new, uh, how to say, new players within the digital media space, you're going to, you are literally scouring and just scraping on the surface of the number of audience. And yet, bear in mind, we only have 32 million people in Malaysia. And, and it is actually a very small cake, a very small pie that everyone is chasing after. And then the biggest pie is usually the Malay language, where uh, most of uh, most Malaysians actually do read uh, Basa Malaysia uh, websites. And then English is even smaller. Chinese is only about 20% or even less. So with new websites, the, the first thing that actually can come to my mind is that how are they going to sustain? Say, if you have about 30 million, how are you going to sustain over a year or two? So question is, when it comes to we want to take revenue from uh, Facebook traffic or even Google Ads traffic, you really need to have at least uh, 2 million uh, unique visitors a month to actually reach up to that level, even in order for you to cover the cost. So this media divergence in terms of uh, new media websites are popping up. My question is always about sustainability because generally you know, those, uh, yeah, those Norman, will sustain. It seems that, mm. yeah, Norman, can you hear me? It, it seems yes, that you know, politicians, you know, uh, in the game of influence, right? They buy these media organizations to uh, to c get influence to shape public opinion and push people in direction in terms of their political behavior. But actually, there are other players, right? I mean, thinking of Fami Reza, who has who sustains himself in p uh, political editorial cartooning through uh, you know uh, platforms like Patreon. You know, and, and he's able to make a good living and continue working and actually, you know, playing the influence game maybe even more uh, effectively than some of these big players with lots of uh, cash and deep pockets. What do you think of that, of these opportunities that are now available? I think that in looking over the past two years, it's a, there are a lot of new opportunities, opportunities even for a lot of journalists. Like myself, as an independent journalist, I, I can have more flexibility. And right now, you can see over the past year, Journalists are also venturing into podcasting. So not just podcasting, we've seen also the emergence of new newsletters uh, where you have a, a tailored newsletter coming to you every day, every week, and people can subscribe to you by as simple as a 10 ringgit subscription. You can, for example, you have Between the Lines, you have the Malaysianness, and this sort of new sort of new revenues, because at the end of the day, when, when if you are if you're running a media company or even running on your own, it's actually building your own branding. So when there is good branding and there is a trust towards that brand you're, you're, you're building as a journalist or even as a media company, your followers will continue to stay with you because there is a sense of trust and also uh, engagement between yourself or the media with your audience. Right. Norman, very quickly, I want to ask you, we've been looking a lot at what I think is peninsula-centric media. What about the media in East Malaysia? Do they face a, a similar issues or a completely different set of challenges? I think they are also facing completely different set of challenges because most of the news uh, that's taking a lot of headlines these days are uh, mostly Klang Valley-centric. And um, we are looking at uh, community papers. It's very different. Uh, if we were right. looking at Sina, Sina started as a community paper. So that actually thrived along the way. But if you're looking at Sabah and Sarawak, um, the most recent uh, casualty to the new emergence of uh, new media, for example, even the, the difficulties when it comes to media industry is New Sabah Times that had to shut down. And right. we also, and the in, in Sarawak, they have their own uh, TVS, okay. but that belongs to the state government. Okay. Right. Norman, thank you so much for uh, speaking with us tonight. We appreciate your time.
Uh, we're going to now turn our attention to this year's theme for World Press Freedom Day. Um, the theme is information as a public good. You know, this theme underlines the fact that it is indisputably important now that we have access to accurate and comprehensive uh, information, and this includes government data. So we'll be speaking to a researcher from Kazana Research Institute in just a couple of minutes. But Sharad, uh, do you think that you know information as a public good is truly understood by the powers that be in Malaysia? Well, I can't speak on, be on their behalf, Melissa, but I, I think that, you know, we've seen over the years a bit of foot dragging on this question. And not, I mean, even during the Pakistan Harapan period, not enough uh, sense of urgency to change the media landscape in terms of these very foundational issues. Yeah. Mm, definitely. So Ashraf Shahruddin uh, joins us on the line now. He's a research associate with Kazana Research Institute, and he's actually written several papers on open government data. So Ashraf, thank you for joining us on the show. Now, when we talk about access to government data, we often cite um, the right to information. And, you know, the, the fact that Malaysia is one of the few countries in the world that does not have the right to information legislation uh, at a national level. What does your research tell Tell you about the confluence um, of the right to information and freedom of press in Malaysia. Thank you, Melissa. I just need to clarify that the right to information and the right to information law is slightly different, uh, has different meaning. Right to information is a basic and fundamental right for anyone to seek, receive and impart information ideas. It is a right that is protected under the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also Article 23 of the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration that Malaysia adopted. So it is part of the freedom of expression because you need information to be able to express opinions. And the right to information law is actually a law that formalizes the means for citizens to request information from public bodies and for public bodies to respond to this request. Where the right to information law is important for press freedom is in the first uh, component of the press freedom, which is pre-publication, uh, meaning that journalists need information from public bodies to be able to communicate it to the public. Uh, therefore, the RTI law provides the avenue for them to request information because we cannot expect journalists to be able to do excellent journalism when they're restricted from getting information from uh, public bodies. And we also need to recognize that public at large depends on journalists and also researchers to digest information from public bodies into simpler messages for them to make informed decisions and hold public officials accountable. So I, Ashraf, I don't... can I ask you, sorry, Ashraf Sharad here. Yeah, sure. Is one of the reasons that our governance uh, system in terms of information is so opaque is that it's intimately tied up with ecosystems of corruption that for corruption to be practiced, you know, effectively by those uh, stake those stakeholders, they need a situation that's opaque and not transparent to public, and that's why we haven't seen a real push towards making uh, data more available and access to public information, as you just suggested. I think the problem is with the uh, legal framework that we have right now, because the only overarching law with regard to government information that we have is the Official Secrets Act, which implies circumspectness in sharing government information. Therefore, it is sensible for public officials to, uh, to practice restraint in sharing government information because the law implies circumspectness. So that's why we need to push for the right to information law, whereby we change the culture of secret by default into open by default. But I would say that the substance of the RTI law is also important because we do not want to merely have an RTI law, but it doesn't have any uh, you know, power to actually uh, compel disclosure of information by public bodies. So what, what do you mean by that? Because you know, I, I was reading a paper and uh, one of the things that you cited was the fact that I think 90% of the world's population lives with, in a country with a, a right to information law but we're in the 10% here in Malaysia. What, what does that look like for us to have um, a good uh, right to information law, a legislation at a national level? Um, we also have to realize that we're now living in the digital age. I think it's now the time for us to have an RTI law, but one that is fitting for a digital age. Uh, one concept that has been uh, raised to prominence uh, lately is open government data. It's, it's a different, a slightly different concept than the right to information 
law whereby right to information law is reactive in nature, meaning that uh, citizens go to the public bodies and request for information and gov uh, public bodies give this information. Whereas open government data is uh, proactive in nature, meaning that public bodies are encouraged to publish as, as, as much uh, data as possible without anyone needing to come to them and asking for, for data. And this made possible due to the advan advancement of digital technology and in internet and make it easy for public mm -hmm. bodies to share government information and for citizens to access this information. So I would say that the way forward, I think, and it's also an open time for us, uh, Malaysia, because we haven't got an RTI law yet, is to formulate an RTI law that also com combines with the concept of open government data and one that is fitting for digital age. For example, encouraging, encouraging government information release in machine readable format and also promoting proactive disclosure of information. Right. Ashraf, thank you for joining us on the show tonight. We really appreciate your time and you sharing My the pleasure. insights and your papers that you've written. Thank you. That's thank all we you. have for you on this episode of Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin, signing off the evening. Thank you so much for watching and good night. Good night.